From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 147, recorded on February 20th, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today, right here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hello, Daniel. Daniel's right here amongst <laughs> us. Comes He comes from afar. Live. From a remote, undisclosed from New York. location. He's it's now here, TWIP. and he's disclosed. Live from that's, New York, it's TWIP. That's right. If only we had all those listeners as Saturday Night Live. (laughs) Well, yeah. You couldn't handle the email. (laughs) We'd need another office just for that. Well, we would hire someone. It's not a problem. Should we just say a word in passing as what the weather is like outside? This is one of the most unseasonable one of the most unseasonable days I've ever experienced. It's unnerving to go from a snowstorm two days ago to (laughs) seventy degrees, but that's exactly what seventeen C. It's below sixty eight. Is it below sixty eight? Because that's it, now. Yeah. What oh, was before it earlier. I bet you we set a record. I don't know. It was, you were just outside, Daniel. Was it nice? And not only that. It tomorrow's is, supposed to be it worse. It is beautiful. It is warm. Yeah, tomorrow's it's sunny. It's, it's sailing, just it's sailing weather. <laughs> it's working weather. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a very busy time. Daniel is wearing a bow tie, and it has oh, he's gi- a It dress. has giardia on it, right? Yeah. Yes, I have my Giardia bow tie on today. Wow. You're eukaryotically dressed. Yes. Daniel, do you remember our, our last case from 146? I do, and let me, let me remind everybody and acquaint those that are uh, clicking in for the first time. <laughs> our case from TWIP 146 was that of a 27-year-old male lawyer who um, was actually he lives, lives in the New York City area, and that, that's where he's um, being seen. And his chief complaint is he has an ulcer on his right foot. Um, This ulcer is four centimeters. That's a little bit less than two inches in diameter for our non-sonometer using people. Uh, This ulcer is painless. It has raised borders, minimal surrounding erythema. And and I made a point, I I remember last time saying that it was not undermined. I right. um, actually saw an undermined ulcer today, so I've got that visual in my head of the difference. Right. Um, this had been going on for, we said quite a while, it was four weeks he's noticed this this ulcer has been there for four weeks. Um, as far as development, he said initially he noticed a papule, so a small bump in this area. It then enlarged, it ulcerated, it then enlarged more, and now it has not healed. This ulcer has been there for four weeks. Wow. He uh, he reports no uh, past medical problems. He initially said he was allergic to penicillin, but this was clarified as just being stomach upset. So not a true allergy. Not on any medications. Um, he uh, drinks socially, but not to excess, at least that he tells us about. <laughs> uh, he lives in an apartment by himself in New York City. Um, and then we get, we get this travel history uh, that yeah. about a month before the papule was noticed, um, he was whitewater rafting in Costa Rica. Uh-huh. Um, and actually, it was sort of like when the papule was at right when he came back. Yeah, sometimes um, it's hard to get these exact histories. But he had, before the papule was noticed, he had been whitewater rafting in Costa Rica. Gets back, he notices this. He says while there, he wore sandals. He got lots of insect bites while they would be bringing the the rafts up onto the sort of areas on the edges of the rivers. Uh, When we see him, he doesn't have a fever, normal blood pressure. He's a fit, athletic young man. Uh, When we examine the lesion, as described, it's non-tender around the edge. The base is red, and there's a little bit of a fibrous coating. The border is raised, as, as we said, and not undermined, just to force that in there again. No surrounding swelling. <laughs> There's no eschar or scab over this. It's just an open, non-healing ulcer. And it's not wet. It's not wet. That's it's interesting that Dixon asks about it. We'll have to figure out what he's talking about later. <laughs> not not too much <laughs> later on, actually. <laughs> okay. We got fifteen responses. Oh yeah. That's a lot. So let's if possible, let's 
truncate them on the reading. Are you able to do that on the fly, Dr. Despomier? I can, but can we just take a break just for one moment to get me online? So that You're I not online. Read okay. along with You're everything? You're not online? I am not. Well, why don't, while you guys are struggling with technology, why don't I go ahead and read our first email? <laughs> so Eric writes, Dear Twipanosomes, I verily, I very rarely write in the guests, the TWIP case of the week, because I very rarely feel confident in my guesses. However, this week, I feel like I just might have the right answer. And initially hearing the symptoms that Dr. Griffin was describing, my mind flashed to dracunculiasis because of its classic manifestation of a skin lesion on the foot. But then the travel history didn't include trips to the old world, ruling out that particular parasite. So I started thinking about parasites of Central South America that might cause skin ulcers. I recalled a little bugger called Tunga penetrans, or the sand flea, which burrows into the skin, causing a lesion or ulcer. But when I read the descriptions of the ulcers caused by Tunga penetrans, they didn't fit Dr. Griffin's description. T. penetrans ulcers usually have a central black dot, and also they're not all that big, certainly not four centimeters. Then, I believe he pronounced it centimeters when he was writing this. But <laughs> then, finally, it came to me. This could be nothing other than cutaneous leishmaniasis. Leishmania can be found in both the old and new world, in tropical and subtropical regions. Manifestations of the disease are the presence of a non-healing raised ulcer, which can easily reach four centimeters in diameter. Having been outdoorsy on his trip to Costa Rica, and probably barefoot since he was whitewater rafting, it's easy to imagine that the patient may have been bitten on the foot by a phlebotomine sand mine carrying the parasite. After a bit of reading, it seems a fairly standard treatment for cutaneous leishmaniasis is amphotericin B and perhaps an antibiotic to prevent secondary infection of the ulcer. Hopefully this wasn't too ham-handed a response. I'm a virologist, not a eukaryotic parasitologist. But I love the show. Keep up the good work. Oh. Outstanding. Peter writes, ah, shared, shared, ah, shared, which means, oh, friends in Gaelic, I guess, right? Yeah. Is it Gaelic? Probably. Um, it's from Ireland, at least. Irish. It's Irish. Irish. <laughs> Actually, that's that's interesting. Well, they'll have to let us know, but there's, when we were just in Ireland um, back in the end of the summer, um, I remember my grandmother who came over from Ireland and she would speak Gaelic and say it was Gaelic. When we were there, there was a revival of what was termed Irish, and they were referring to uh -huh. Irish. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, uh, Peter is in Dublin. Sending this from a cold, bright, and blustery Dublin, Ireland, high of 6 or 7C. I wrote in before Christmas, which resulted in the question, did James Joyce go to Trinity, Trinity College, Dublin? Vincent correctly said he went to University College, Dublin. Uh -huh. Not to be outdone by my colleagues in UCD, University <laughs> College Dublin, Trinity can boast of other literary greats such as Deirdre Madden, Bram Stoker, Oscar Wilde, and Samuel Beckett. That's a nice list. Ian Donahue in our department sometimes uses Beckett's quote, in the landscape of extinction, precision is next to godliness, <laughs> to great effect during his presentations, including when speaking of his recent paper he wrote with Montoya and Pym, Planetary Boundaries for Biodiversity, Implausible Science, Pernicious Policies. Wow. Trends in Ecology and Evolution, a thought-provoking paper that may interest you. Uh, as a side note, by the way, Pim, for a brief moment in time, used to be a faculty member here mm. at Columbia University, and he's world famous for his work on food chains and food webs, in case someone wants to know. Nice. In my quest for precision in tackling the case studies, I often wish somebody else in our parasitology group would come into the lab when I am listening to them so I could avail of their expertise. Mm -hmm. So today I sent around an email saying 10 minutes before coffee <laughs> break, I would be listening to the case study in the coffee room if anyone would be around. I was lucky enough to be joined by Gwendolyn Disliper, who does great work investigating the proteins that are produced in the liver during Ascaris infection, cool. and Juliette Picard, who does exciting work with Maureen Williams using an acanthocephala model to un answer the question, does parasitism interact with warming to modify energy flow in ecosystems? Huh. From proteins to ecosystems, hopefully a broad enough spectrum to tackle the case. <laughs> During an enjoyable discussion, we came to a diagnosis. After ruling out botfly due to the description of the wound, we settled on a species of leishmania. This was due to the physical description of the wound and its development, the time it took to appear and develop, and that it was painless. 
patients' travel history to Costa Rica and insect bites also agree with leishmania. To confirm it and identify it to species level, we would carry out PCR. Species identification is important as treatment will be species dependent as some species found in Latin America may spread to the mucous membrane. Hope we are right, but had a lot of fun coming up for, with our answer. Nice. For a pick of the week, I suggest this great piece of science journalism on parasites in the New York Times, the parasite uh, on the playground. You guys must have seen this article, right? <laughs> well, maybe. Groundworm eggs shed by stray dogs can be ingested by children playing outside. The worm's larvae have been found in the brain, experts say, perhaps <laughs> impairing development. Toxocara. Right. Do do they impair development, Daniel? So Peter Hotez, right, is the big person that yep. um, has done the work in this area. And um, we, we actually quoted some of that in our textbook. Is And I'll say it's one of those where it may be the case. There mm -hmm. is some evidence to sure. suggest this. Um, and, I, and his suggestion is that this is maybe more prevalent than people realize. And a lot of yep. people That's in, right. That's right. in urban areas, right, where you're seeing this and where the New York Times is talking about, and also in a lot of... Um, Rural areas, so sort of the extremes. Maybe you're okay in the suburbs or something. But right. uh, he's quoted <laughs> in this article, in fact. <laughs> oh, okay. Where right. they have a lovely photo of a of a Toxocara worm. Right. How recent was the article? Oh, it's just it was uh, actually recent, January sixteenth, yeah. wow, last month. And he says it is one of the most common parasites in the country and the most neglected in this country. I would agree with that. And we are in the U.S. Yep. Well, thank you for that. Yep. Great to hear about the parasitology heroine Marietta Vosges in the last episode and really enjoyed her quote, Is Mies Le Mias? Peter Stewart, Trinity College, Dublin. What does Is Mies Le Mias mean? Let's, let's ask Google. <laughs> is Mies Le Mias? Ooh. Um, it's an Irish salutation. It is I with respect. It's like sincerely at the end of a letter. <laughs> Right. I don't think that was from Marietta, though. I think that was from Peter. <laughs> no, it was from Peter Stewart, Trinity <laughs> right. College, Dublin. Sounds like a nice place. Yeah, uh, Dublin is a great place, actually. All right, Dixon, you have your glasses? I do. Let's go to the next one. I do. Carlos writes, Hi, Twip Trio. My name is Carlo. Sorry, Carlo. I said Carlos. I take it all back. Uh, my name is Carlo, and I'm a longtime listener. I, current, I am currently a meds... Peds resident, very interested in infectious disease. Med peds, we pronounce it. Med peds, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, you say meds, why not meads? <laughs> it's true. My differential for the 27 year old male lawyer with a right foot ulcer who recently came back from Costa Rica is localized New World cutaneous leishmaniasis, Dracunculus metanensis, cellulitis, cellulitis, and pyoderma gangrenosum. And atypical mycobacterium. Mm. Those are the differential diagnoses. Per Parasitic Diseases 6th edition, Leishmania forms large, painless, crateriform ulcers. This is the most likely this is most likely the cause of the ulcer given the description of the ulcer in his recent travel history to Costa Rica. Another parasite that can cause cutaneous ulcers is Dracunculus metanensis, but the travel history is not consistent as it is prevalent in Central Africa, the Middle East, and India. Less likely to be a bacterial cellulitis due to the chronicity and the lack of erythema, swelling, and systemic symptoms. Also less likely, pyoderma gangrenosum, as there was no reported history of inflammatory bowel disease or GI symptoms. Atypical mycobacterium, less likely as no recent exposures and no history of immunosuppression. To diagnose leishmaniasis, a sample should be sent for culture, microscopy, or nucleic acid amplification testing from the margin of an active ulcer that is not obviously superinfected. He most likely has leishmania panamensis or leishmania brasiliensis. Hmm. He should have a nasal and oropharyngeal exam to make sure he does not have nasocutaneous involvement. He may be treated with localized therapy, including cryotherapy, thermotherapy, topical paromomycin, or sodium stibogluconate. Looking forward to the next podcast. Keep up the great work. Lucian writes, Dear Twipsters, for this week's study, I would suggest leash ma Leishmania. From the downloadable copy of Parasitic Diseases, Leishmania infection produces large painless ulcers that start as a papule. The parasite transmitted from the bite of a sandfly is present in the New World, including Costa Rica. Two to eight weeks after being 
bitten, a papule forms, which as infection progresses, turns into a large crateriform ulcer as the intracellular parasite induces cell death. The ulcer can take weeks to months to heal. All the above is from a, the very excellent book. Based on its current symptoms, large painless crateriform ulcer with raised edges. It's been present for a month that started as a papule following a trip to Costa Rica. I believe the fellow has a leishmania infection. In addition, the ulcer is not spread to other parts of the body. It's not painful as might be expected from bacterial infection. Given that Costa Rica is north of the so-called mucosal belt, there's probably no need for systemic therapy. Cryotherapy may be sufficient to resolve the infection. Hmm. Yosef writes, Dear TWIP team, my guess for this case is cutaneous leishmaniasis. Unfortunately, our patient was likely bit by an infected sandfly. Topical paromomycin treatment can be given. Sincerely, Yosef Davidov, emailing from Kisoro, Uganda. All right. Trudy writes, Hi, Twippers. I think the lawyer has cutaneous leishmaniasis. This would be consistent with the fact that he wore sandals and was subjected to lots of insect bites. So he was most likely bitten by an infected sandfly. As I understand it, there is usually no treatment necessary as the infection resolves on its own, resulting in lifelong immunity. Yeah, right. I got a little lost here. <laughs> but I will I'll, I'll I'll jump back in. Harrison writes, Hello, good doctors. I am a junior studying public health, and I love this podcast. This is my attempt at a differential diagnosis for the male patient from episode 146. The painless fit also with raised borders may be, and we get a differential bacterial decubitus or parasitic. Bacterial foot ulcers might be caused by staph aureus or beta hemolytic strept. These infections are common in diabetic patients. A decubitus ulcer is caused by prolonged pressure on a small area, perhaps the foot. Um, but lastly, I come to the parasitic causes of foot ulcers. And being that this is a parasite podcast, I will use this as my final diagnosis. <laughs> um, my first idea would be a parasite that is transmitted by flying insects. Based on the patient reporting that he has many insect bites, I think this is New World Cutaneous Leishmaniasis. According to the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases and Information from the CDC, the disease starts as a small red papule two day weeks after injections of the metacyclic probastigotes. The sandfly is the primary source of the infection, but I assume, well, he says, but I assume other biting insects could cause this. Dixon, please correct if this is wrong. Uh, I'd be glad to. I think the sandfly is the sole uh, transmitter of this infection. Yeah, that's actually what we th what we think. We I know we make a point of that in our book, and I also make the point I'm jumping in here that these are sand, not beach flies, because people have right. often said, "Well, how do they get this up in the mountains?" I'm like, <laughs> right. because there are sand flies up that's in right. the mountains. That's right. That's so right. these are sand, but not beach flies. <laughs> and exactly. as we we currently believe that sand flies are the only vector. Okay, sand flies become infected when they suck blood from an infected animal or human. Diagnosis is confirmed by PCR isolation of the organism. The edges of the ulcers can be scraped and then sent to pathology for identification. And the healing of the lesion may be spontaneous and require no medication. Uh, the use of insect repellent and clothing treated with an insecticide will offer protection. And then, in conclusion, I enjoyed writing this, and I hope that I've correct, correctly diagnosed this infection. Thanks hmm. for the biweekly education and entertainment. All the best. Harrison is from East Carolina University. Nice. The next one, Sarah writes, Dear Podfessors. That's a new one. Podfessors. I like that. <laughs> As promised in my very first TWIP email last episode, I'm going to join in the case study guessing. Hopefully this will be the start of a pattern and I can refresh my parasite knowledge on a more regular basis and hone my detective skills in the process. Mm -hmm. Hearing Daniel describe the case... Of the 27-year-old male lawyer, I could only think of one thing, cutaneous leishmaniasis. Whether this was because of my ignorance of many other suitable parasites or because of my instant recognition of the correct culprit remains to be seen. Uh, so let me see if I can shorten this a bit. Painless also raised borders, travel history, new world leishmaniasis, scrolling around the new free copy of Parasitic Diseases. Patient mentioned had been in Costa Rica a month or so prior to consultation with the purpose of enjoying some rafting. Unfortunately for him, being a fit young man does not exempt you from getting insect bites. <laughs> right. I assume he, a sandfly, Lutzomaya, being the vector species in the America, 
had located the slightly inadequately protected area and managed to inject some metacyclic progmastigotes. Confirm the diagnosis. Sample from the margins of the lesion to PCR. Current bane of my lab life, microscopy culturing, NAT or histology. Correct diagnosis is important, as some may have the potential to cause mucocutaneous. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can resolve itself eventually, given proper wound treatment, uh, or there are drugs, antimonials, amphotericin, miltefacine, azole drugs. Choice it depends on the severity and location of the lesion. I hope I've done myself justice with this first guess, especially since I was fortunate enough to see a cutaneous leishmaniasis case during my time at university when a friend returning from an expedition in South America came home with a large lesion on her face. Oh, dear. Contrary to what you might think, she was less disturbed by her misfortune and more fascinated by the progress and eventual healing of the lesion, a true scientist and parasitology (laughs) student. Dear, dear. She credited the excellent advice and treatment given to her by NHS, National Health Service, doctors and nurses in Glasgow for her calm dealings with the parasites. And I have to agree and say the knowledge of tropical diseases here is just remarkably good. Perhaps it's because we like to think of tropical places as the relentless rain that (laughs) rules the world outside our office windows, even if it means having to think of disease-causing parasites. Anyway, that's my guess. Apologies for the lengthy email. I'd like to leave you with a few last thoughts. One, thanks to the TWIM team for confirming my suspicions that what you pronounce as sonometer, indeed, sonometer, centimeter, really helps with (laughs) the case guesses. Thanks to the listener who wrote in with a female heroine. I had never heard of her before. Now I have. Thanks to you for making her your episode hero. All right. I look forward to seeing her and other cool heroines in PD soon. Parasitic diseases. Finally, I also look forward to Vincent convincing his wife to come on one of the podcasts and talk about her career and life balance, et cetera. It would be be great to heal for her. And add my voice to those calling for an appearance. Many thanks. Your faithful listener and new correspondent, Sarah, in Glasgow. Very nice. Sarah's at the Center for Virus Research, which I have visited twice. Oh, neat. Dixon de Pommier. Suellen writes, I've not taken a shot at the case studies in a while, but now that I'm all caught up on the TWIV, I thought I'd try my luck with this one. The case of the 27-year-old New York lawyer with the open sore on his foot. I spent a good deal of time with my Parasitic Diseases 6th edition PDF, and the most likely candidate I could find was cutaneous leishmaniasis. However, the description of the disease does not does indicate that the papule should be around one centimeter, not the four centimeter that is reported in the case, and that there should be more than one ulcer, so I might not be correct in my diagnosis. Still, the description given in PD6 does seem pretty spot on. The typical lesion seen in cutaneous leishmaniasis is a node, nodule that enlarges into a painless ulcer with an indurated border. So I'll go with that. Also, I want to add that I really enjoyed this past episode. I enjoyed them all, but this one is especially fun because around the 48th minute or so, Daniel and Dixon started totally geeking out over malaria as only two dedicated Parasite fans could do. I listened to that part twice. It was so great. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the accolade. <laughs> I have to give all of the Twix podcasts um, props for helping me decide to change careers at this rather late point in my life. After spending almost 30 years as a database administrator, I decided to take a sabbatical and try something new. I'm studying phlebotomy at the moment and hope to get a job in a hospital or healthcare facility after I get my certification. I am lucky enough not to need a big income, but I do want to do something that interests me. So keep those podcasts coming. Keep geeking out over parasites and keep inspiring people like me to try something new. Neat. All right. Melissa writes, hello, hosts of the TWIP universe. (laughs) Here's my guest for TWIP 146 case study. And she goes on. Let's see if we can go through this. She, I glanced down at the caption that said Tunga Penetrans. So this gets her thinking. Right. She opens up the CD site, search for Tunga. A couple of clicks later, she's reading about how the female flea burrows into the skin. But the CDC says Tunga penetrans is found in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. This would include Costa Rica. And she's going to go ahead and give us some treatment for this is to surgically remove the flea. Uh, for any other, and then she actually gives a link here to the CDC DPDX. And these are, um, these are actually great. These are monthly case studies. Um, and they're actually a lot of fun. You go and you do the case study. Later on, you can actually look at the uh, the answer. Mm, Sincerely, right. so she's going with Melissa. Tunga penetrance. Tunga penetrance. She's going to go with Tunga penetrance. All right. Okay. 
David writes, dear estimate, dear and estimated professors. <laughs> Does he meet I esteem? Hope he met esteem. I think it's because of the estimados. Estimados. Uh. He's from uh, Nicaragua. <laughs> As always, I listen with great joy to your program. If the world is a stage, the TWIP podcast combines comedy in the friendly interaction between the hosts, e.g. where Dixon gives thanks to the small people, <laughs> with the tragic reality of parasitic infections. Last year, I seemed to experience a consistent lag in processing the podcast and consistently was too late to write in. When I missed yet another case with my favorite eosinophilia, because <laughs> it has self-limiting range of causes and I sort of have a decision chart worked out by now, I decided to assign the next case a higher priority. I must admit that the telltale signs of the athletic youngster's infection after a visit to Costa Rica also made me feel quite confident that the case is one of cutaneous leishmaniasis. I read through the introductory section in Parasitic Diseases. Uh, what a great reading and what a great parasite manipulating the human immune system with foul trickery. We even managed to insert the Cuban diaspora of emigrants who fled first to Ecuador, I believe, to go over the land through Colombia and Darien, which is really a jungle, only to be blocked on the border of Costa Rica with Nicaragua by the devious power of geopolitics. Mm -hmm. This is the introductory section in your book. Yep. It's describing concerning treatment. Not quite sure how I should interpret the text. I have no formal medical background. After all, would it be enough to keep the wound clean, or did you freeze the ulcer with liquid nitrogen? Finally, I did not read this, but I am curious. Does it make any sense medically to use anti-inflammatory drugs to keep the immune system in check? Mm. Saluting you from a windy Hinotepe in Nicaragua, David. Huh. We'll get back to that, Daniel, the freezing. Oh, definitely, definitely. If, if it turns out it's leishmaniasis. If it does. All right, Dan <laughs> Dixon de Pommier. Uh, Lewis writes, Dear esteemed TWIP hosts, First of all, thank you for the informative and interesting podcast, which serves as a highlight to my commute. This week's podcast appears to have proposed a case that, strangely enough, a parasite enthusiast without special training might be able to diagnose. Based on the description of an ulcer on the patient's foot, it appears our patient has contracted cutaneous leishmaniasis from the bite of a sandfly while rafting in Costa Rica. The depressed ulcer with raised edge and lack of pain are strong indicators of CL, though a definitive diagnosis through isolation of the organism or PCR is recommended. In this patient's case, an accurate species-level diagnosis using the clay acid amplification testing is important since L. brasiliensis is a likely culprit. For old-world leishmaniasis, local treatment may be indicated, but L. brasiliensis found in the New World has a 2-10% to 10 chance of metastasizing to the patient's mucocutaneous junctions and forming the dreaded mucocutaneous leishmaniasis even after the original ulcer heals. As such, a systemic therapy would be indicated to ensure the patient doesn't develop ulcers around the mouth or worse. If any of the above sounds familiar, most of it is paraphrased from the free, downloadable version of Parasitic Diseases. Thanks again for all you do, Lewis. P.S. It is unclear from Parasitic Diseases whether the ulcer associated with CL is painful. This may, a good be, this may be a good clarification to add in the next edition. Jamie writes, Dear Twip. <laughs> and illustrates, I must say, too. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Twip Paladins, or should I say, the three amigos of Parasitology. It's a wonderful, I think we should put this up on the website. This you know, he, he made me the shortest, which is correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. And he made me the fattest, which is also correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Greetings from Caracas, where, perhaps as a compensation to our current worsening economic and political climate weather this time of year is the closest it could be to perfection. Clear, blue, clear skies, average temperature of 18C with a high oh, that's lovely. of 24C and a lowest of 13C. Perfect. Again, thanks for the fantastic job you perform in providing such an entertaining and informative podcast. Even for an infectious diseases and tropical medicine specialist like me, each episode brings plenty of useful information and challenges our clinical skills particularly when Dr. Griffin deftly presents interesting <laughs> clinical cases from remote or unique geographic locations. In regard with your last case, the first diagnostic consideration should be cutaneous leishmaniasis. Uh, since there are no specific morphological features there are, that are pathognomonic for cutaneous leishmaniasis, the differential diagnosis includes staph skin infection, cutaneous neoplasm, pyoderma gangrenosum, sporotrichosis, mm. fromomycosis, cutaneous tuberculosis, atypical mycobacterial infection, 
syphilis, yaws, and loxosalism. Loxosalism. I love that. Yeah. You know, that was the, one of the cases I joked that I was going to present, but decided not to. <laughs> um, right. A definitive diagnosis can be accomplished by identification of the causative parasite. Uh, it talks about it, GIMSA stain scraping, punch biopsy, and culture or PCR. And then we get Leishmania as a parasite with complex life cycle involving wild animal reservoirs and vectors. The common species of Leishmania species in Costa Rica belong to the subgenus Viana. Um, Viana <laughs> pa- panamensis is the most frequent and occasionally um, Brasiliensis. Common vectors are Lutzamaya. Lephil leptor and Lutzamaya ancestra, and these are telomophage insects. Uh, principal reservoirs of infection in the country, according to studies, include the sloths and a particular rodent. And then there is a nice rhyme. A global, tra- a global traveler begins to unpack, and on his leg finds an ulcerated plaque. The possibilities are many, numbering far more than 20. Leishmaniasis is a lurking issue, so the savvy physician tests the tissue. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's lovely. <laughs> that is quite something. <laughs> and then he talks a bit about pentavalent antimonial drugs, um, sodium stibagluconate and glumine antimoniate. Um, and finally, the Tropical Medicine Committee of the Pan American Association of Infectious Diseases, API, which I happen to coordinate, would be much interested in making the PDF version in Spanish of the sixth edition of Infermidades Parasitarias um, available to our affiliates. Although it is currently downloadable for free at the web page, we would like to know whether or not it is necessary to ask for a formal authorization. Um, by the way, I call your attention to it. Yes. <laughs> the correct spelling in Spanish is edición, not edocion. <laughs> Lo siento <Yes>. mucho. <laughs> so we, we've, we've already corrected that. Yeah, we have. And, so that has been corrected on the uh, on the downloadable uh, copies, and uh, I think it's fair to say, Dixon, that please go ahead. And we invite you. We invite you to go ahead and dis- distribute it to often as many and widely. That's correct. You could never wear out a PDF. Yeah. yeah, just just keep distributing. Our goal is to get knowledge to the people and places that need it the most, and we encourage you to help us in that right. mission. So I, I want to add something to the rhyming thing over here. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Then all of a sudden, his knowledge gave him a tug, and the physician recommended the correct drug. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Look at that. Last one is from David. Dear hosts, I believe the 27-year-old lawyer from New York is suffering from cutaneous leishmaniasis, most likely panamensis or brasiliensis. In Costa Rica, there is an apparent absence of El Mexicana, which is typically the causative agent of New World cutaneous leishmaniasis. And most cases in Costa Rica appear to have stemmed from El Panamensis. In the New World, cutaneous leishmaniasis and spread by sandflies in the Lutzomia genus. Uh, the glowing red ulcerating non-tender lesion matches the image of a cutaneous ulcer spurned and the timing of the infection a month after exposure fits the diagnosis. The treatment has been highly debated and typically topical paromomycin has been issued for those who suffer from cutaneous lesions. Thank you once again for the informative and entertaining podcast. 15 guesses, 14 cutaneous leishmaniasis, one tungo penetrans. Right. So in this case, democracy rules. <laughs> 14 to 1. Right. And do you have to get the correct answer to win a book? We, we decided no, right? We decided we didn't want no, to we're going to randomize. So it is random. That. So let's uh, let's find what are the results of our random generator. All right, we had fifteen um, guesses, so we pick a number between one and fifteen. Are you ready? We are. Number thirteen. Oh. So let me work up. David is fifteen. Fourteen. Number thirteen is Lewis from. It's not where I don't know where, but he is the winner. Lewis, please. Uh, send us your address. Send your address to twip at microbe.tv. If you are in the continental U.S., that will suffice. If you're overseas, we also need a phone number. Right. Congratulations, Lewis, who guessed correctly. Congratulations. So, Daniel. Where where was Lewis? Do we know where Lewis is th- from? It's just number 13. It's just a few up from the bottom. Okay, Lewis. He's above the um, <clears throat> Amigos. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure where he's from. Right? <laughs> yeah, we don't know where Lewis is from. Some people tell us where they're from. 
Others yeah. are remain remote and unknown. So I guess before we do the unveil, should Un- uh, unveil. should we ask what you guys are thinking? Yeah, no. uh, Dixon got it right away. In fact, I think he got it right away. <laughs> someone said as soon as he got it, they know it was this. So, Dixon, what did you think? Of well, you? no, I think Utani Shlishmoyasis was certainly my uh, first and only guess, to, to be honest, without yeah, seeing I, any I, tests or anything. I agree, but I think the lesion is so huge. Uh, it's still, I've seen lesions. That you big. have seen? Oh, See, yeah. I have no experience. So, Yeah, we had a lab infection once that uh, actually got quite big on somebody's uh, back of their hand. Uh, but but mostly uh, you go to a doctor before it gets that large, and then they start treating. I see. Yeah. The nature of the, the ulcer was- It's slow. And I mean, where this a, young man has been. That's right. That's uh, right. That was really the- Exactly point. right. Would have been interesting to ask him if anybody else in the party uh, got infected also. Yeah, no one no one did. So no one did. Oh, did so we already said that. So we already know that. So you're you're thinking it's leishmaniasis. I am. Yes, I am. And uh, I don't think it's tongue penetrance. Vincent is a little bit concerned about the size of the lesion. Can I say why I don't Daniel think it's says, uh, you can You can say that. Yeah, well, tongue penetrans is associated with an intense itching that just won't go yeah. away. And these fleas, when they're excreting, I guess they're byproducts, and some of them come out uh, through the bottom of their abdomen, through their GI tract, but other secretions like the uh, ones that they use to gain their food uh, from the host with uh, cause huge irritations, and the itching can be so bad. Uh, that I've been told this, that in some places in Africa where they've had multiple lesions on the bottom of their feet, they simply amputated their own toes mm. in order wow. to get rid of the itch. Yeah, that's, no, that's, how bad that's it actually true. Yeah. So that's this is definitely not that because uh, you, you'd you know right away just by the symptoms whether or not this was one of those things. Mm. And also I think size, just to throw. <laughs> size, it, right. Is, yeah, and it, it's a it, white, it's a white sort of mm-hmm. a, not even raised area with a little black dot in the middle. It almost looks yeah. like a butt fly, but indeed it's not a butt fly. It looks exactly like it should look a tongue of penetrans lesion. Yep. All right. So Vincent, are you are, are you on board? Um, you, you're the experts, I believe. That, yeah. <laughs> I'm on board. Well, so then the next so thinking this, how would you approach it, Dixon? You're you're the, How would I approach this how lesion? Would, how, how would you approach it? How would we figure out it? How would we confirm this? Well, you do a DNA test, of course. You do a PCR test. Where, where would you so, get the material from? I would take it from the margin of the lesion mm-hmm. and I would use a biopsy needle. It almost looks like a little burr. All right. It's got little raised edges on it and it's like a needle, but it doesn't have a hollow end entity you drive it into the lesion and pull backwards and some some tissue sticks to these little burrs and then you take those and either amplify them in the naa uh tests or t rather uh, or you inoculate into schneider's medium and you try to raise the prosmastic goats to see if they're could uh, you see any in the in the biopsy you could if you know what you were looking for you know if you did a histological section you could see them of course but you know it takes an expert to to, to identify them like basically. you well, or someone else that's used to looking at this. Usually, someone doing research on the subject. <laughs> no, no, I'm not an expert on leishmaniasis. I, I worked in a lab where other people used it, and they showed me things, so I, I picked up mm. secondhand knowledge. But uh, but when you worked in the lab here, you never saw any le- leishmaniasis cases. No, I never said that at all. And in fact, we were called in all the time for people returning from the Middle East. In those days, it was oil executives that got this infection, and they got it mostly in Saudi Arabia and places like that. And so uh, it was easy to see. I mean, it was not uh, difficult to diagnose at all. Was this an issue with um, troops? Troops in the yes, it first, was. Of course it first was. Uh, Gulf you War, bet. right? Yeah, and, and not only that, some of these things visceralized in the U.S. troops because they had never been exposed before, which is never the case for people living in the areas. But they mm-hmm. they got visceral forms of, of a cutaneous leishmaniasis for El Tropica, and, and that's not a nice thing to have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in this case, the uh, the gentleman did have a biopsy right at the margin, mm-hmm. and that's critical. You don't want to take a biopsy in the center. There, there's no. no organisms. There's no yield that's there. Right. And uh, so the indurated, the hard area around the edge is actually probably larger than you might realize initially as you treat these. But around the edge is where the living parasites are. And in this case, um, actually, we we looked and you could see the Leishmania parasites. They have this characteristic mm. dot and dash. And um, you know, here in the U.S., we often do biopsies. But I have to say, when I was down in South America, we would do these touch preps. We actually would take a slide, and right at the edge of the lesion, you can yeah. take the slide and push it with a certain amount of pressure that you actually get um, some 
specimen onto the slide, and you can see it then doing these touch sure. wraps with. And know, they're much bigger. I mean, they they are, it's, it's like doing a, a a tissue impression smear mm-hmm. uh, from the liver to look for uh, uh, visceral ischemiasis. It's it's they're remarkably easy to spot at that point. But um, yeah, so that was done in this case. So it was actually confirmed that this um, individual had leishmaniasis. Right. Um, and yeah, maybe we should talk. So. How do you how do you do it? As we talked about, you can find it microscopically. You can see this characteristic dot and dash, but it does take trained eyes. <laughs> I remember sure. looking at these, and then, but once someone points at you, you're like, oh, there they are. But it, it takes that, you know, getting <laughs> getting right. getting your eyes focused on where this the parasite, right. what the parasite is. Yeah. Um, the nucleic acid amplification testing um, available in some places more than others, and as some of our people that emailed in. This becomes really important, particularly in the new world, in making the distinction between species that can form mucocutaneous disease and those that just restrict themselves to cutaneous mm-hmm. disease. Right. And I like one of our um, emailers wrote in, he talked about the mucocutaneous belt. Mm-hmm. And so the predominant species is Brasiliensis. But I would say that I would like people to think of three is when they think of Leishmania. So there's three main manifestations of Leishmaniasis, cutaneous mucocutaneous and visceral in general. It's also a interesting diffuse cutaneous um, form, but we'll leave that. That breaks my rule. Um, and then there are, in general, three subspecies of Leishmania that can cause mucocutaneous disease. So Brasiliensis, Guyanensis, Panamensis, right. very rarely Amazonensis. I whisper that because, again, I'm violating my rule of three. But the Brasiliensis actually makes up the majority of the mucocutaneous um, cases. And I've seen estimates. I've seen 2 to 10%. I saw an estimate as high as 30%. I'm not sure we know exactly. There, there's some range. Yeah. It's significant enough with Brasiliensis that if we're worried about that um, species, in a large percent of the time, we will actually recommend systemic treatment right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. If we think it's just a cutaneous um, one, and they're, they're named after a lot of the different countries, like Peruviana, Panamensis, Guyanensis, yeah, exactly. Brasilia, exactly. you know, you can actually go through the list. Um, and as you get farther from Brazil, I guess I'll say your likelihood of it being a Brasiliensis strain diminishes. There's also another very interesting virus that can be associated with with the severity of disease, severity of reaction, maybe even the mucocutaneous potential. And this is a Leishmania virus. Mm-hmm. Right. And Double so stranded that, RNA virus. Is exactly. That's yes, right. We it's talked an RNA about virus. it years ago. We did. We did. And so that's an interesting thing. So in some of our people talked in, so what, what do we what do we do? Now this gentleman mm. just said, I'm gonna do anything, I'm gonna see if it gets better on its own. <laughs> just you know, and that often happens. And he was not in Brazil. He was not willing to sort of undergo, you know, a little more extensive. And it did actually just get better all on its own. Right. How long did it and take? It's been years now that this has healed. It it took a few months. It took about three months, and then it did heal. Mm-hmm. So there's a permanent scar that results from this healing, though. Yeah, there? and that's why I was a little worried about the uh, uh, yeah, fortune, yeah, the emailer who was I fortunate to see it on the woman's face. Yeah, I thought that about that. Right y- over you here. can end up. You usually do end up with some degree of a of a. Mm. You know, it can be as mild as hypopigmented zones, and I've seen that where people yeah. it just becomes hypopigmented. Right. But unfortunately, a lot of times on the face, it can actually, um, mm. yeah, have a significant. Um, impact on and it has social kids. implications as well because um in at least some cultures throughout the middle east uh, when that uh, shows up on someone's face they become uh, unmarriageable and that uh, it's it's a it's a horrible uh, consequence of this infection for those people because they the family unit is the thing that uh, holds them together and without having the ability to have a family uh, it means that she's an outcast from that society, and that's really a a harsh um, way of dealing with disease. And and unfortunately, cultures uh, that don't understand the meanings of these things beyond the disfiguring um, ability of a parasite uh, have adopted them as uh, their way of behavior. And and it's obviously not for us to question those behaviors, but it's just a it's not part of our culture for sure. It's not part of Western Europe or United States or, or even in North America. But uh, it's it's sad because 
you know, you, you think of this person, but she was in Glasgow. And so I have a feeling that the scar might be a, a red badge of courage in this case. <laughs> you know, you should say, look, I survived leishmaniasis. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> I wonder, too, in different um, different genetic backgrounds, the different level of scarring yeah. that you might see. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. So, uh, Is this a common infection you see here from people coming from these areas? You know, it's interesting. The Costa, the reason I picked the Costa Rica mm. case is that it's almost become the place where they come from. Yeah, and, it, you know, it's, we talk about, we joke about like the board questions where you sort of know when you read the yeah. first sentence, like, you know, individual whitewater rafting in Costa Rica now has a non-healing, <laughs> non-healing ulcer. Uh, painless non-healing ulcer like oh leishmaniasis <laughs> That's exactly um, yeah no this sort of become a cliche and uh and i think it is because of the the tourism that occurs in mm. those areas involves a lot of times with people with bare feet and legs now the sand flies uh, people got a little bit of our cycle here is the sand flies are really tiny delicate uh, mm. insects and they can only usually fly like about 24 inches so most of the bites are going to be down on the lower extremities yeah. In general, right? I mean, we talk about chiclera also. Those are up on the ears. And, the, you know, most people's ears are more than 24 inches from the ground. So there are certain cases when you can get mm. bit. But in general, they are usually poor flyers. They usually don't go very far from where they live. They also tend not to go very high. Mm. So what puts people at risk is being there with uncovered right. feet, lower legs. Right, right. And, and so course, there is a biting yeah. period during the day. And when these flies are more active than other times, and it's it's true that they're more active very early in the morning and very early, uh, late in the evening or, or near the near the evening, not not quite evening. They're crepuscular. They're crepuscular, mm-hmm. and so therefore, if your if your work activity takes you out into the, the the bush early in the morning or keeps you there until late afternoon, you're you're at risk. And that's why Chiclera's ulcer is so uh, interesting because the people who get out there first get the most Chiclero. And, and, the most the, bites. and the most bites, and of course they end up with their their ears all uh, eaten away by these poor lesions that they get. But of course, when you get it once and you, you're cured, you don't get it again. So that's nice. So that's the know. idea behind the scarification. Yeah, that's right. Which exactly is nice. right. Exactly. So if you're in an area of the world, for instance, um, you know, so we talk about cutaneous leishmaniasis being both an old and new world problem, and in general, mucocutaneous being a new world problem mm-hmm. so in the old world in areas where let's say there's like infantum or tropa tropicalis i'm, I'm having trouble tropic tropica. tropica tropica thank you yes tropica um now those is this um what uh, dixon was talking about which actually we realize now is tied to um smallpox and other things where they actually do the scarification process mm-hmm. and they do it on an area maybe on your buttocks is in general the way they do it in um in the Middle East, in the Mediterranean region. And what you do is someone has a cutaneous leishmaniasis ulcer. You scrape, historically, the edge of this, the margin with their organisms, and then you scarify, you scratch, you scratch the buttocks area, and they get a cutaneous lesion there. And they now develop species-specific mm, immunity. So now they can't get it on their face. Right. But a little bit of a risk, let's say you're in Brazil and you do this. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's a problem because about 10% <clears throat> of the time, right. Now they've got their initial lesion on the buttock, but now they can get this metastatic spread, mm. and it can spread to um, the soft palate, the nasal area, any other, mm. you know, the the vermilion border of the lips. Interesting. Um, and then they can end up with this really destructive secondary disease. Do we understand why it's painless? Is something going on there that mm. the, the organism is not producing any anesthet- anesthetics, as do mosquitoes? Or kills all the right? nerve cells. <laughs> so there, there are two. There's two features I think we know about. The, the leishmaniasis parasites do have an impact on our immune system in two ways. One is that these ulcers tend to get less infected mm-hmm. um, relative to the open skin breakdown than you would imagine. So they actually are producing antibacterial compounds, but they're also producing anti-inflammatory mm-hmm. compounds. Because okay. as soon as you treat and start to kill these, that area of induration, which you thought was only a centimeter, mm-hmm. Centimeter. <laughs> Son- <laughs> centimeter. Several is, is suddenly several centimeters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you realize, oh, it was quite spread, but there was a certain amount of immune right. um, suppression that was occurring. Right. 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 Neat. Um, yeah, so. All right. There you go. Good review. Good case. Anything else you're done with that, Daniel? What was I going to say? Oh, so Dick, what Dixon brought up reminded me. Uh, the other night, Dixon and I went to a um, an event. We did. Mm-hmm. At the Explorers Club right here in New York City. And the Explorers Club is a club that Teddy Roosevelt used to belong to. And what a group had done, 
DNDI. This is a group that had formed to um, produce, distribute, and now develop drugs for neglected tropical diseases. Um, they had worked with the Huffington Post. They had created these mm. virtual reality experiences to give people a sense of what it's like to interact with people who are suffering from neglected diseases. And um, they had um, a couple stories, and and one of them, you know, you, you put on your virtual reality um, headgear and and headphones, and and suddenly for 10, 15 minutes, you feel like you're you're in Uganda with um, mm-hmm. these people. And one of them was the story of a of a woman in her late twenties. And she has lymphatic filariasis. So one of the legs is enlarged. Um, in certain parts of the world, like Guyana, they call it big foot disease. So she's got this really large, elephantitic, um, swollen, disfigured leg. And her parents keep trying to introduce her to suitors. And as soon as they see that, that that's it. They're gone. And she had said 20 had mm. come and 20 had wow. left. And it's really sad to see um, you know, a disease that would take such a small amount of intervention to mm, really yeah. address. And uh, yeah. yep. you know, here again is a woman who will not have a family, who will not um, realize those dreams in life because of these diseases. And here it's 2018. This is still going on. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, heartbreaking. Yep. All right. Thank you, Daniel. We'll come back with another case, hopefully. Oh, yeah. But first, we have a paper. We do. This was suggested by a listener. And this was, I think, the winner last time of the book. And he said, why don't you do this paper? It's, it's different. It's, it involves ecology. And the title is, it's published in the Journal of Parasitology. And the title is, Introduced Rats and an Endemic Roundworm. Does Rattus Rattus contribute to Bayless Ascaris Procyonis transmission in California? And the author is Sarah Weinstein, who is in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, which is must be one of the most beautiful yeah, places is. to be in the U.S. at sure. least. <laughs> I totally would agree with you. And so good for you. The question here, it's all about invasive species. Yes. And, and the p- paper begins, invasive species create opportunities and challenges for native parasites. Although introduced species often host a depauperate parasite community. I'm sorry, what was that word, Vincent? Depauperate. Really? Which I didn't ever... It, it means somewhat limited. I mean, it, it could basically, a niche that could have more members, but is not quite completely full, right? I mean, that's... Well, that's I looked it up, and that's exactly right. <laughs> so the question here is, what happens with parasites and in, in, in newly in, uh, introduced species? And so... In this paper, the author explores um, a, an invasive old world species, the black rat, Rattus ratus, right. and how this might alter transmission of a new world parasite, the raccoon roundworm, Bayless ascaris procyonis, a large ascarid nematode. Tell us the life cycle, Dixon. Oh, this. Oh, <laughs> you don't want to tell us. You no, don't no, no. I would us. love to tell you life cycle. What is it? We've discussed this many times before, but it's always good to review. I don't remember. So it starts with an egg. Let's start with the egg, uh, which is produced by the adult female, and she produces huge numbers of eggs per day. The human ascaris produces over two hundred thousand eggs every day, Amazing. and it can do this for. Three to five in the, years. In the intestine. In the intestine, small intestine. And out they, they, they go. All live, and out they go. They're fertilized, but they're not embryonated. Mm-hmm. The egg then has to sit outdoors somehow and get exposed to the environment in order to stimulate the cell division inside, which results in the formation of a larva. That larva then is now infectious. And if the egg is swallowed mm-hmm. by the next host, it could be uh, you know another raccoon. Or it could be, uh, in this case, uh, a small m- mammal, mm-hmm. uh, in this case, a rat. But other, they investigated other animals here, too. And, and this was a surprise. If, if, if humans ingest the egg of Ascaris limbricoides after they're embryonated, they become reinfected. Mm-hmm. Eventually, if you get reinfected again and again and again, you do build up immunity against these migrating larvae. And you can suppress the development of them. Uh, it doesn't end up kicking out the adult worms, so and then they can stay. But if the eggs are ingested by some other animal, let's say a dog or a cat or something like this, those eggs could hatch and penetrate the gut tract of those animals. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they realize, oh my gosh, I'm not in a human. Now what am I going to do? And they start wandering around looking for a way out, basically. 
Now, in this case, Bayless ascaris is a native parasite to raccoons. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not a parasite of rats. It's not a parasite of mice. But they can become infected by ingesting embryonated eggs of Bayless ascaris. But what happens is the raccoon parasite hatches out into the gut tract of a rat, penetrates the gut tract thinking it's on its way to complete the life cycle, and the next thing you know, it's in an aberrant host. Mm -hmm. And it stays in that aberrant host until the host dies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, ordinarily what happens is, let's say Bayless ascaris, the raccoon eats the embryonated eggs and gets another infection, but it, it's not straightforward. The worm hatches in the gut tract of the raccoon. It penetrates the gut of the raccoon, gets into the blood supply, goes to the liver first, eats some liver tissue, then grows a little bit, for some foie gras, <laughs> stops off for a little lunch. It takes a couple of days for this to happen. The worm then gets back into the circulation and circulates up into the lung fields. And by this time, it has achieved a diameter larger than the capillary in the lung, in the alveolus. And that stimulates the worm to penetrate into the alveolar space. It's called thigmotexis. Out it goes into the alveolar space. It crawls up the alveolar uh, tube out into the bronchioles, into the bronchus, over the epiglottis, and swallowed and down into the intestinal tract for a second time. And now it starts to develop into an adult worm. And that takes about two or three months for it to achieve adulthood. And that's true for all the ascarids. Toxicaricanus, Toxicaricati, uh, Ascaris lumbricoides, Ascaris uh, sum in the pig, uh, and in this case, Bayless Ascaris in the gut tract of the mm -hmm. raccoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say that's the important, is you break the name in half. This is a Bayless that, Ascaris. So this correct. is an Ascaris. This is the life cycle of the Ascaris. Right. When you're in the right host, you follow this. That's right. Uh, we call it the teenage life cycle, right? Because they, <laughs> they're they right. in the gut. They go all over the place, and then they come back to the gut. They like, do. Okay, now what the, was that all about? What is the genus name for raccoon? I don't know that answer. Could we look so, that So up? Bayless actually is named after the man. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. it's not actually. All right, all right, all right. So it's take it all back. Bayless's Ascaris. Take it all back. They, they, um, but very often they do that. If, if a human <laughs> yep, ingested yep. some Bayless ascaris, oh well, you know that's happened, and it's 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 happened with tragic results because uh, basically these larvae inside the Bayless ascaris egg, uh, once they get into a human host, and in particularly a, a child, uh, and these are the recorded case histories that we have on record, this worm eventually ends up in the brain tissue. And mm -hmm. as a result, Amazing. they're much larger than the other ascarids, and they're much more active. And these children have actually died from this infection. Okay. By the way. It can be fatal. The raccoon is Procyon lotor. Thank you. So, so that's the, the, the species name is the Procyon. 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 Okay, yeah, fine. That, that matches. Yeah, we should talk a little bit about the clinical. Now, that, that's the problem that Dixon brings and up. That's called that visceral larval migrants when it's in people. And it's not our species. It's called visceral larva migraines. And Toxicara can also cause the same syndromes. Okay. But usually you don't die from that one. This one you die from, and it's quite different. Yeah, and not everyone dies, because I know I've no, been right. emailed I mean, about this highly, in the past. It's, it's got a high mortality rate. Yeah, it has, it has a high, I think it's about 10%. So there, there is, and um, but you know, a fair number of people do, mm -hmm. do live, but 10% is higher than I would be comfortable with. But the, the big difference with this one, and I think Dixon kept sort of throwing in the word large, is that when you get this larval migraines, this aberrant larval migraines, it can often go to the brain and then it continues to enlarge. I see. And that right. can be a problem. So you have this space enlarging lesion where a lot of the other ones, you know, they're, they're small and they go these places. You don't have quite the same degree of pathology. Right. Uh, mm. We we presented a case thing of a young uh, young lady here um, in the New York area who yeah, acquired right. this. That's right. What I found amazing about this paper, I'm sure you're going to get to it, so I don't want to I don't want to throw out a spoiler right now. But when you get to a certain point of describing the infection in these uh, these uh, diaspora <laughs> hosts, um, we'll we'll talk about that. Okay. I found that okay. fascinating that finding. A few a few other little tidbits here. So. Raccoons shed millions of eggs a day. Millions. Millions. And the eggs accumulate at communal defecation ah, sites yes. that are called latrines. That's right. So the raccoons go to the same place. They're very fastidious, oh, and they have a place for their feces. Apparently, eggs infect young raccoons, but adults are resistant, but they get worms from... Exposed. But they can eat worms from infected birds and other small animals that they ingest, right? Right. They're paratenic hosts, right? right? 
Right. Uh, and they get infected. So the birds and the small mammals, like rodents, get infected when they forage in a latrine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And they get the eggs. Now, in the paratonic hosts, I think you mentioned this, the eggs hatch and the larvae migrate through the tissues yes. of birds. And, well, I, and I, 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 can, I, can I yeah. tweak that a little bit? Because paratonic just means no stage development. It just it, It's a physical carrier. So like a, yeah. a housefly landing on some So species. eggs hatching and yeah, that, it's that, not right. No, that, those are aberrant hosts. Yeah, exactly. So that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. we have to distinguish between those two things. So anyway, in small mammals, this can be fatal because it can go to the brain. Exactly. Right? Um, and these animals get incapacitated, birds and rodents, and the raccoons can easily catch them. <laughs> well, that was the fascinating part of this paper. Right? When you looked at where these worms were in each of these aberrant hosts, yeah. they didn't all go to the same place. No, they go in different places. They say She says that the, in, in, a, in an incapacitated animal, in a dead animal, the worms will survive up to six days. Right. And she says, we don't know how, how much, how often raccoons scavenge. Exactly. But, you know, once a raccoon would eat a worm, it would then become an egg-producing adult, right? Exactly right. And she says that the raccoon, uh, the, the prevalence of Bayless Ascaris in adult raccoons suggests that they regularly eat infected animals. Right. Because they have worms in them, and they shouldn't because they, that's right. they're resistant that's when right. they get older. That's right. And that's part of the problem here is to find out what other animals are carrying uh, in this particular area. Sure. And they look at mice and... Uh, so she said only white-footed deer mice have really been looked at, Paramiscus leucopus. Yeah. But she wants to look at rats, Rattus rattus. That's right, which is an invading species in that area. Where did it come from? Do you know? Rattus rattus is an old world rat. I don't know. It must it, have come on a ship, Africa? right? Africa, oh, of course, of yeah. course. I believe Asia. I mean, Rattus norvegicus came from, I guess, Norway. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Rattus rattus is the uh, Asian rat? I believe okay. so. Let me. I think it's I not had... a wharf rat. It's not a wharf rat. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a different rat. Yeah, so the black rats were Asian, and so the raccoons were here, and the raccoons have right. sort of had yeah. it both ways. Like <laughs> we've we've distributed raccoons through the world. Black rats were coming from Asia. Yeah, yeah. But the ecology yep. of this is fascinating. So right. she surveyed a place in Santa Barbara called the the coal. It's an ecological reserve called the Coal Oil Point Reserve. It's a sixty three hectare University of California preserve. It has dune, grassland, scrub. And she looked for the rodents. Um, she tried to see if they scavenged by watching, and then um, took them apart and looked for she did <laughs> for worms. Yeah, well, that, was, that was the part when I was kind of like, "Did I read that correctly?" <laughs> it's in Santa Barbara County, <laughs> oh yeah, over eighty percent of the raccoons have adult uh, Bayless Ascaris. That's remarkable. In them, latrines are very common, and she she identified thirty five potential paratonic host species. She, she calls okay, them okay, she instead of a barrent, but she calls them okay, paratonic. Okay. And what she did, she set traps. This is done in March, yeah. uh, twenty thirteen through twenty fifteen, and it would check these regularly. She got five rodent species: sixty seven Paramiscus maniculatus, fifty five. <laughs> Rythrodontomus, 20 Rattus Rattus, 5 Mus Musculus. And a partridge in a pear tree. And one Microtus <laughs> Californicus. And they were processed for larval uh, Bayless Ascaris. Mm-hmm. The brain and viscera were squashed between glass plates. Yep. The gut was opened and examined and so forth. So she could calculate how many worms were yeah, in, yeah, each, yeah. in each one. She actually counted worms. She did. Right? She did. Um, so what did she get? No rodents showed sign of neurological damage. That was very interesting, I thought. Most musculus and micro, microtus californicus were rarely trapped. Right. And she, the ones she did, she found no uh, BP. in Because they weren't feeding at the latrines. They were feeding somewhere else. they mostly grain feeders or insect feeders. And they're not looking for scraps left over by raccoons, which rarely they leave. They rarely leave scraps. They're pretty thorough in their eating habits. She does talk, though, about the infection rate relative to distance from the latrines. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's, that's right. So the paramiscus and the rythrodontomus, 45% and 4% were infected with three and 0.13 worms per mouse. These are two different mice, but rats. Seventy-five percent of the rats were infected, and they had seven hundred and fifteen plus or minus fourteen hundred worms that's per rat. A standard deviation. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> so the raccoon roundworm was common, but rats had a lot more worms than mice. So Daniel, what about this proximity issue? 
Well, they talk about the more heavily infected rats were actually caught closer to l- latrines. Yeah. Yeah, that's they right. also talk about the females hosting more worms than the male did. So there, there tends to be a little bit of variable. Because right. I think the push is that this is all kind of being derived from the latrine as a source of infection. Right. Yeah. Bigger worms, bigger animals, more worms. All right. So what kinds of tissues, gut, liver, lung, muscle, and brain and the distribution was different in mice and rats. Yeah, I really thought that was fascinating. Is that interesting? Fascinating stuff. So first of all, no mouse had more than 40 worms, and 55% had encapsulated wor- worms in their brains. What does that mean, encapsulated? Well, either they died. The worms died, right. Or the brain tissue had an immunologic response, which doesn't sound possible. So it's probably yeah. that the worms were in an abnormal place, and they just didn't died. make it. And the rats had nearly a thousand worms on average, and over ninety percent were encapsulated in the gut wall and mesentery. How about that? And only one was found in rat brain tissue. Which means that they're stopped right at the gut, right at that point. They know that they're not in the right host. Yeah, they just stay there, and they don't go anywhere. Then, in rats, worms were rarely found in muscle or brain, and in mice, these tissues were the most commonly infected. How about muscle that? And brain, totally different, right? How about that? So she estimated that the larval worm population, the total larval worm population, um, the rat population in this area supports over 30,000 worms, an order of magnitude greater than in mice, and 50 times more than the adult worm population of raccoons. Right. That's it. So I wonder if they were catching rats and eating them or just waiting for them to die from something else. So let's see. The scavenging trials, raccoons, skunks, opossums, or rats picked up 87% of the mice within six days. Right. So everybody's eating mice, Every- which aren't <laughs> that infected though, right? No, that's right. <laughs> uh, raccoons ate 16% of mice in her trials. Uh, but nobody eats the rats, of course, right? We don't see them eating the rats. But that's the point here is that the rats are picking up worms. They must be eaten by something, right? Would a raccoon eat a rat? Uh, well, that's what I thought this actually said. They didn't have any evidence that the rats were eaten by the raccoons? She did, she only <clears throat> looked at the, the mice being eaten, right? And she didn't really look at the rats being eaten. Well, maybe, there's maybe another she... possibility here, and that is that the mice eat the rat carcasses, and then the raccoons eat that the mice. That could be. But these other um, animals, the skunks... The opossums. Yeah, I mean, she's she is high. I guess I'll I'll throw. In, you know, one is she is hypothesizing that the raccoons are um, preferentially scavenging larger rat carcasses, yeah. um, and then that that is involved in this um, in this thing. I, I think the other thing, which was you know just sort of to jump back in on, you know, when we make the distinction between why do certain um, aberrant infections cause. Uh, cutaneous versus visceral mm-hmm. part of it can be a lack of enzymes right so they the, right. a lot of the cutaneous um, larval migrants they lack an enzyme to penetrate the other can be they're not the right um, homing signals right. which is There's part of environmental the, cue, yeah right. the environmental cues are yeah, lacking right. yeah um, so i think those are interesting issues but yeah she's actually hypothesizing from this work that their raccoons are preferentially scavenging larger rat carcasses mm. and um that's kind of part of the idea about why this might be an issue. Yeah. I mean, this basically the rat is a, is a reservoir now for the, I mean, rats die. I don't think they're, the raccoons are killing them. They're more scavengers, right? I can't imagine a raccoon. Well, no, you know what? Raccoons catch a lot of live food. Uh They eat a lot of crustaceans like crayfish and things like this in freshwater. So I I would be, I would love to know if raccoons actually hunted rats. Mm Hmm. Well, they're certainly going to eat the carcasses, right? Because the rat is a competitor for the raccoons uh, when they raid garbage cans and stuff like this around peri-domestic locations. So are they competitors for the same food source? And does a rat being much smaller than a raccoon obviously is uh, less able to fend for itself once it encounters a raccoon? And raccoons have big, sharp teeth Mm -hmm. and very, very remarkably um, agile um, prehensile feet and – uh, their claws are almost like humans when they start to pick apart a, a piece of um, tissue when they start to eat. They're they're quite intelligent also, and they uh, they're they're wonderful animals in in many ways. So I don't think she ever saw the raccoons scavenging rats, but that's the idea here, right? Because they're a big reservoir of the worms. Exactly so. right. And so. it's interesting that this is a new species that came in; it got infected. Sure. Boom. Sure. So. 
Anything missing from this study, Dixon? Uh, well, I think it's a study that needs to be continued, frankly. Yeah. I think you need to make the links between the rats that get hyperinfected and the raccoons that are also hyperinfected. And you've got to make the connection someplace. Uh, in areas where there are no rats and mm-hmm. there are still raccoons with Bayless Ascaris, do they have as high a, an infection rate, for instance? Do they catch it all of the latrine? Right. From their eggs, you know, because that's for certainly the way most animals catch their ascarids. Yep. But um, another thing that needs to be said here is that there are other ways of distributing the eggs from the latrines. And one of those is earthworms. Hmm. Uh, earthworms <laughs> uh, are n- uh, noted for, you know, coming up above ground at night and uh, feeding on detritus, which this would be, yeah. and ingesting the eggs. And those now become peritonic hosts because they can take that egg and crawl back down into their hole and then come up sometime later in another hole and defecate. And the egg now has moved from the latrine all the way over to the other side of the yard. And then cool. and, and birds can do that too, by the way, but yeah. earthworms are particularly good at it. Yeah, I like the whole concept of all these questions that now come up is we've always worried about invasive species for a number of reasons. Now we have one more reason to worry about invasive species. The idea that not only are they disturbing a food chain, but they may be providing a way of amplifying parasites. Right. So she needs to do some um, videos using infrared cameras at night Mm. on dead rat carcasses to watch to see what happens. That'd be cool. Yeah, that that was what I wanted to say. Put them right (laughs) next to the latrines or put them in a cage and see if they elicit, you know, a raccoon to go over and try to get it out so that it can, you know, either eat it or chase it off. It's got some night pictures of rat skunks. Yeah, you know, that's that's true. That's true. So you could do those uh, motion activated. Uh, They do for tigers and several other studies where something moves into the area, you leave the carcass, something moves in and then boom, the recording starts. Yeah. One of the charming features of this paper I found was the fact that she wrote it in the first person. Yes. Because you don't find that often. She's the only author, but that still doesn't mean that she will write it. And then the next thing I did was, you know, and she's actually as if she's talking to the reader directly. Yeah, it's interesting. Which yeah. we usually don't use. No. <laughs> it was fun to read. I think it was an enjoyable. Yeah, no, no. She's got a good writing style. This, uh, this work, by the way, so, so the author, uh, Sarah Weinstein, is a graduate student or was, and this study was supported by the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowships Program. That's money NSF. Well spent. Money well spent. It's great st- because that's the only that's right. uh, organization that would fund this kind of work, right? That's right. So you know, well, maybe the uh, U.S. The NIH might have had a role in this, but yeah. but NS- NSF takes the ecology approach to all these things, and this is yeah. an ecological approach, but it's still has huge implications for human disease because these raccoons sure. are peridomestic. Yeah, right? you could make that. All right. Uh, Dixon, do you have a hero? Today, my hero is Theodore Maximilian Billhartz, oh. M.D., <laughs> who lived from 1825 to 1862. Now, I know a lot of people out there recognize the word Billhartz because the disease that's named after him is often referred to as Billhartzia. But we've changed that since uh, we've classified this group of schistosomes, and now we call it schistosomiasis. But Bilharzia and schistosomiasis are the same entities. So the um, the caption underneath the photograph of Bilharz reads, A Theodore Maximilian Bilharz described the adult stage of Hymenolepis nana, which is a tapeworm, and schistosoma hematobium in human patients that had come to autopsy while Bill Hartz was serving in the German Army Medical Corps as Lieutenant Colonel and Chief of Surgery at Kazer El Anini Hospital in Cairo, Egypt. In collaboration with von Siebold, he made the connection between blood in the urine and infection with schistosoma hematobium. He probably did a lot more things than that too, but these are the things that related very much to the parasitic diseases that we're uh, chronicling in our uh, sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases. So, um, our hats off to um, Theodore Bilharts for all the wonderful work he did while he was uh, active in the military. I would say, you know, in places where I've been in Africa, the local people still refer to schistosomiasis as Bilhartsia. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it sort of crosses, uh, yep. you know. So Egypt became a training ground for all of the original cadre of parasitologists that came out of Germany and France and England, they all went to Egypt because they thought that most of the infectious diseases that, that hadn't been described yet could be found there. And many of them were, and they, they weren't wrong. All right. 
I was just thinking about nice. that when I said that. You know, people think, really? People in the local area know the word Bill Hartz? Yeah. I remember in the 1980s when I first went to China. Um, this is back when it was quite challenging to get in, but I used to speak Mandarin. I was over there in southern China, and they knew the word schistosomiasis. How about that? And so in parts of the world, right, where these are part of their yeah. life. Um, That's you know, where Patrick Manson practiced, by the way, in oh. Taiwan and in certain parts of southern China as well. So. Okay. Yeah, right. so they actually, you know, oddly enough, here they 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 know this name. They yeah, know it's Bill cool. Hartzia in How these places. It? Cool. Great. Daniel, you have another case for us. I do. Hope everybody is ready. A three-year-old boy, and I'm seeing this boy when I was down in South America. He was brought in by his mother who said that he'd been sick for about a month. And I just want to say when I saw him, I kind of got the sense maybe a little more than a month. But that's what she's saying. She says that previously he'd been healthy. He has four healthy siblings. Um, his vaccinations are up to date, but now he's been having abdominal pain. Uh, she took him to the local traditional healer who gave him some medicines, but that didn't seem to improve things. And so now she's seeing um, us at this Western Medical Center. Um, she reports that his belly pain increases throughout the day, that he does not have a good appetite, and that he's um, constipated. Um, occasionally he does have what she describes as goat stools. And when we clarify what, what she means by that, she says that these are like pellets of stool that are coming out. Um, she reports that he has um, had fever, um, that he seems swollen, that his face is pale, his urine is dark, um, his belly is distended. Uh, she says occasionally he's coughing. Um, get a little bitter, better sense of her living conditions um, and um, they're limited as far as their resources. They um, live in a home with a dirt floor. Um, he spends most of his day, she says, on this dirt floor. Uh, when we see the young man, he, um, he actually is febrile. He has a fever. He doesn't look good. He, he looks um, like he's not doing well. I, I use the term toxic appearing. Um, he doesn't have any teeth, so we can keep that in mind in his development. Um, he's sort of sleepy. He's not particularly responsive. His belly is very distended. He looks pale. He only weighs 13 kilograms. And remember, this is a three-year-old boy. And he has a diffuse, scaly um, skin um, inflammation um, around the whole perianal area. He also has um, perioral chelitis. So at the corners of his mouth, he has breakdown of the skin. Um, we do some labs. Um, his white count is 11,000, 69% seg, six bands, 22 lymphs, one eosinophil. His uh, hemoglobin is 7.6. His transaminitis, so these are the liver tests, AST, ALT are normal. His bilirubin is normal. Um, across the board, his sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, these are all a little bit low. Uh, we do a couple tests, um, blood cultures, HIV, HTLV1, these are all negative. I, I have some pictures of his, um, of his pretty extensive, um, showing Dixon and Vincent, a pretty extensive buttock. Um, it's more than a rash. It really looks kind of desquamated and mm. scabbed areas. Yeah, you call that diffuse scaly skin inflammation in the perianal area. Exactly. And also breakdown of skin around his mouth, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. I didn't catch the labs, but they can listen to you. <laughs> yeah, they can. That's okay. Um, and uh, all right. Wait, did you send out for O and P? Well, th these would be my questions. What do we do? What do we right. do next? I mean, so this is oh, our. Did I miss that? I, no, no, I, that's I a, did miss that. No, no, question. that's an okay. So that, that becomes our question. So that, that's what we have. That's what we know. Right. Um, first off, I always say what's the cheapest thing is more history. So there's anything else you want to know? Eating habits, maybe. So as mentioned, he's um, he's the youngest of. Five, right? Oh, does any four, of the other children have the similar everybody thing? Everybody else is doing great. Okay. Everyone else is older. Everyone else is doing great. So it's just him. He's the he's the youngest. And he's mostly inside on uh, in the dirt floor all day? Mostly at home on the doesn't dirt go floor outside, all day. Doesn't go outside. Not very much. Animals in the house? Um, so there are dogs. There's a lot of um, uh, goats and sheep and yeah, they, that's different what animals. Mentioned. Do they yeah. come in the house? Pigs? Um, yeah, chickens. They're in and out of the house. No pigs? Um, they don't mention pigs, but, you know, they're... There are pigs in the area, but they don't mention them. Did you say goats? House. Goats. And they all walk pigs. around barefoot, right? <laughs> Guinea pigs, exactly. Guinea pigs, because, you know, you, you got to eat. 
You bet. They uh, walk around barefoot. A lot of people walk around barefoot, yeah. And this is a tropical region, right? So this is down in uh, yeah, down in South America, in a tropical part of South America. I'd like to see an O&P, that's for sure. Okay. Sort of wondering if I should give any more. What do you guys think? Are we, are we good enough with where, like, I have to say at this point, I'm not really sure what he has from, you know, but. Right, me neither. People, I, mean, so I, should, I don't have a, yeah. a, an opinion right now, but yeah. um, if you were to tell us that you sent out for a particular test and it came back positive, that might yeah. give us a so direction. That, that'll be the last thing I say. So we did send out a um, stool, ova, and parasites. Fine. We did send that out. Just one or and, multiple? And the first one came back with, with something that was very telling. With something. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't know how much more I should give people. Because well, I, I feel like I, I give any more, they might know what it is. Yeah, no, that's enough. That's fine. That's plenty. I think you okay. got a lot there. Yeah, these these are good signs and symptoms. Yep. All right. Yeah, but I think it. that actually is helpful to say that there was an OMP, it was sent out, and it did, that, yeah. give us, it did give us the diagnosis. Yeah. Constipated, but when he did go, it was goat-like. Goat-like. Yep. In little... Little pellets. And there were goats around. Intimating so. that was, <laughs> <laughs> there were little goats. That's and, right. there were, and there were goats in the environment. And now. you weren't kidding. <laughs> no, but how no, does she no. know <laughs> it's his feces or the goat's feces? Exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, we we do uh, we will give away another book for this, so send in your we guesses. Will. Twip, will. twip at microbe.tv. Uh, let's do just... Um, one email each. How's that? All right. Gretchen writes, Dear Twipom, first of all, thanks for taking the time that you put into edutaining all of us. You and the other Twix podcasts make my time working an assembly line bearable. That's cool. I just finished listening to the most recent episode and there was an error I simply can't overlook. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. It was in an email, not anything y'all said. The emailer who described the Dax character in Star Trek got the process a bit muddled. Dax is the symbiont, quote, parasite that moves to a new host only at the end of its current host's life. And it's not really a parasite. Once it is implanted in the trill host, they integrate into the central nervous system and the host can't live without them. Uh The trill are the humanoid alien species that these symbionts co-evolved with. On the trill home world, the symbionts can breed and live without a host for an extended time. In Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Jadzia, is the trill host that carries the Dax symbiont and is known as Jadzia Dax. I know this is a bit rambling, but we hold you to quality and accuracy standards in what you say. I believe it is only fair that we licensees hold each other to the same standards. Whether here in Mentor, Ohio, is an unreasonable seasonably warm 60F with a chance of rain. Thanks again, Gretchen. P.S. Be nice to Dixon. There you go. Dixon. Yes, Dave writes. Hi, everyone. I love Twix, especially Twip. Perhaps a bit surprising since my background is in electrical engineering lasers electronics and such my only single biology class was in high school and as i recall it consisted almost entirely of memorizing genus species names of seaweed (laughs) not a great incentive to continue at least for me and nor i i wouldn't have become a biologist under those circumstances how I wish one of you would have taught that class instead. Well, that's great. Um, I wish I could have. I then went on to study the physical sciences at Caltech. Oh, that's a great place. Where, frankly, there wasn't a lot of time or opportunity to branch out f- from your major. But now, many decades later, I'm making amends. Keep up the great work. Anyway, today I saw an article about a Canadian couple that contracted hookworm while vacationing in the Dominican Republic. After their return and eventual diagnosis, they found that Health Canada would not give them access to ivermectin. Quotes, in terms of treatment, the couple was told they could take a drug called ivermectin. Stevens said their doctor sent Health uh, Canada, a request for the medication, as it's not licensed in Canada, which included their case files and photos of their feet. I guess you had creeping eruption. Maybe that's what they were treating. Stevens said that they were expecting to receive the drug this week, but they received some unfortunate news from their doctor on Tuesday, end quotes. Quotes, we found out that Health Canada had denied our request to receive the medication, saying our case wasn't severe enough. At that point, that's when we freaked out a little, she said. Instead, Zetner's mother had to drive to Detroit and pay 88 Canadian dollars to pick up the medication for the couple. Zeitner and Steffens said they took the medication for two days. I won't read the rest. You can't get ivermectin in Canada? I give it to our dogs every month in California. And that's true, by the way. I believe this story entirely. You can't get it in Canada? Is that right? Well, you can't get it for this one. Because uh, this is not a life-threatening disease, basically. Nice. So for, for compassionate use... 
Uh, they had itching bottoms of their feet because they had stepped on dog feces that had the uh, uh, Ancelostoma caninum uh, larvae in the uh, stool, and uh, that's what they came back with. Because in the Dominican Republic, there's no law against running your dogs on the beach. Yeah, right. Are you... Uh... So this would be the cutaneous larva yeah. migraines that we yeah, discussed. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it is tough. Um, Creeping eruption. So you yeah. can't treat it with anything else in Canada? No, you could, you could treat it, it with other things. You can um, you can do albendazole, which costs yeah. a fortune. Right. You can do you topical use. thiobendazole, which works as well. Okay. Yeah, it's but it is, it's self-limiting. And I that, think that's, that might be is. the thing. Just but wait. there's an intense yeah. itching associated with it. It keeps you up at night. You're worried about what it might be. You know, you're never sure of what it is. Um, I, I would have given them the drug. I usually do. <laughs> Here in the U.S., I what tend, can I say? That's, I tend to treat because then um, it it's like within the next day, the next day, yeah. because it is. It, it's actually it's very upsetting if you have this because it is moving. There yeah, is a right. snake-like red line right. that is That's moving right. around right. under your skin, and you're and, itching like crazy, and you're you're really distracted. I think it's more of the psychological to know that there is a parasitic worm <laughs> that is migrating around under the skin right. of your body. Yeah, it's, and sure. <laughs> totally creepy. And I've done it where I've had patients take pictures, yeah. like initially, they take another picture like every hour, and it's, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's probably not doing them a favor, but it's curious for me. Okay. <laughs> well, last, <laughs> no one. last one. Last <laughs> one. Dear Twim Crew, this right. is my third time writing in. I adore um, all of your work. When I was struggling to wrap my head around the enormous world of microbiology, you were there for me. We should have theme music that comes in right then. But <laughs> I have just graduated with my BS in microbiology and cell science. I'm hoping to receive your book because I have applied to join the Peace Corps to work as a health extension volunteer in Cambodia. This decision was in large part because of Dixon. Hmm. I love hearing tales and anecdotes from the raconteer's storied career, and I hope to be able to accomplish a fraction of what he has accomplished in his. I have equal respect for Dr. Racaniello and the rest of the crew. That's me. But the stories stand out, <laughs> and I think it's awesome that they, Dr. De Pommier practically bootstrapped himself into a new career in urban agriculture once the world had deemed his T. spiralis problems to be relatively solved. That said, a couple of my professors have been less enthusiastic about my choice to volunteer for the Peace Corps. Hmm. The commitment is two to three years, but in this time, they said I should continue to be working away in a lab and apply to grad schools. I do not want to join the Peace Corps at the cost of my career in science. I am the sort of person who obsesses over the biochemistry of my lab work and wants to try to conceptualize every problem in abstract algebra in case there is some algorithm to optimize the process that nobody else has thought of. So I need my scientific outlet. Do you guys know how I could do science in the field and keep my career moving forward on all fronts? Uh, that's a good question. If you were my boss and I were going into the bush, is there anything you would want to know that I could tell you? In the meantime, I am applying to bench jobs. But should I also apply to run the flow cytometry in the core lab facilities? It pays really well, but I doubt I would have the opportunity uh-huh. to contribute to any papers as an author in that capacity. Right. Uh-huh. Also, Dr. De Pombier said that with contemporary molecular methods, he could have accomplished so much more over the course of his career. I know he also said that there was not much funding for trichinella spiralis, but it is super interesting to me to know the sorts of hypotheses that he would jump at the chance to interrogate if he woke up one morning and was suddenly 24 again in the information age. Oh my Grateful goodness. for any and all of your thoughts, Noah. P.S. When I was first listening, imagine how disappointed I was when I went to R2208 ARB and Dr. Condit was nowhere to be found. <laughs> oh. Peace Corps. Should he do the Peace Corps? Uh, that's a toss-up. It, you know, a Peace Corps experience is really uh, maturing, and it really opens your eyes to a lot of things that you didn't know were there, but you would see them right away when you got to those places, especially Cambodia. Um, but you can't do any science. Right? Cambodia's a fascinating place. Well, you know, there are some people there doing work on dengue and um, lots yeah. of other diseases that are ende- endemic for the area, but uh, you're right, there's not much lab work, but you could get involved in some epidemiology. There is a dengue treatment center in the in the middle of Siem Reap, which is the uh, mm-hmm. one of the cities that uh, is near uh, Angkor Wat, and um, you could probably hook up with some people there. If you speak French, it would be better because they they just speak French at that point. Yeah, what would I, you say? I, you, know, you know, I'd say yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, because you know, I would, I mean, the opportunity Noah, for travel yeah. like that is it doesn't come around that often. And when you come back, you'll be a better person for it, I'm sure, from many other aspects. And then you can continue your lab work after that. So I, I would um, respectfully disagree with your advisor and tell you to uh, 
follow your heart and your head will find a way to think it through. And uh, this is one of those situations where I think the romance of international travel and uh, seeing a strange country for the first time and, and also getting to know the people because Peace Corps workers uh, fit right into the, the, the scenery after a while. They become part of the landscape. Uh, there's, there's no substitute for that experience. And Cambodia is one of my favorite countries. I, mean, I would agree. You know, the, the ability to spend a couple of years in Cambodia. Yeah, that would be and um, yeah, Noah, reach, reach out to us if you when you know, you know, if you're going to go and where you're going. Um, I know a number of people in um, the Angkor Wat Children's Hospital. I know um, a couple people in the big city um, down south. Right. Um, one of them actually runs a Muslim hospital. The other runs a Christian clinic. Right. Um, and there, the, you know, there there can be. Penn? In Phnom Penh, there yeah. can be opportunities um, to to do interesting things, mm-hmm. um, but I think you're just going to come back as a as a more mature, more educated, more experienced person. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, I know myself as the physician scientist thing I've done, where what keeps me motivated in going is seeing these people mm-hmm. and seeing what my work translates into. That's right. That's right. And so I, I think it's great stuff. Yeah, I would agree. All right. Dixon, if you could do one thing today on Trichinella, what would it be? I would do proteomics. I would definitely do it. You want to see what's in there? Hmm? I want to know what those secreted products are. Secret. All of them. And then you would knock out the genes one by no, one. No, well, I'd, I would have a better story to tell with regards to the development of the nurse cell and how the parasite continues to live in a host for 20 years. All right. That's Thank what I would do. Okay, that's TWIP147, microbe.tv slash TWIP. Send us your Questions, comments, guesses, twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Medical Center where amazing things, things are, are happening. happening. <laughs> also, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Right. Thank you, Daniel. Good to see you. Oh, pleasure. <laughs> Dixon de Pommier is at parasiteswithoutborders.com. Yeah. And livingriver.org. Indeed. Thank you, Dixon. Oh, what a fun time this was. This was great. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I thank Ronald Jenkins for the music you hear on TWIP, ronaldjenkins.com and ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is, is parasitic. parasitic.